If crypto is digital gold, then gold must be analog crypto. As you build your digital portfolio, don't leave your analog portfolio behind. Gold is a timeless asset that offers unique diversification, but there's a better way to own gold than paying storage and management fees. With monetary metals, you can own gold and earn a yield on it paid in more ounces of physical gold and it's all vaulted and insured on your behalf for free. Their Gold Yield Marketplace platform connects you with opportunities to lease or lend your metal to expertly vetted companies. You choose which opportunities you want to participate in, then sit back and watch your ounces grow every month. The question isn't crypto or gold. The question is how to maximize the value of your assets so you can be better prepared for the future. Earn 2 to 5% on gold, or if you're an accredited investor, you can earn 12% on silver in their latest offer. Go to realvision.com slash metals. Hey everyone, look, sorry, this is the cheesy interruption that you get on YouTube channels, but they're really important. I'd really appreciate it if you just hit the subscribe button. You see, it makes a difference to know how I'm doing, seeing the growth in subscribers if we're getting the right content. Obviously, comments help as well. But hitting the subscribe button allows me also to book the best guests. It really does make a difference. So if you do enjoy this content, and I know you do because you keep coming back to watch it, just please hit the subscribe button. Sorry again for the cheese, but it is important. I appreciate it so much. Take care. Hello, everyone. I'm Raoul Pal, and this is my show, The Journeyman. And The Journeyman is my exploration at that nexus of crypto, macro, and the exponential age of technology. Now, I think you've learned by now, I like to mix it up between the macro and the crypto, but the technology is the thing that is really blowing my mind. It's capturing more of my attention. The crypto thing, sure, we've got our bets on. There's not a great deal to do. The macro, well, that doesn't change a lot. You know, we wait over time for the business cycle to develop to look for the great opportunities. And we're in that macro summer transitioning to macro fall that will take us for the next 18 months. So there's pretty much nothing to do for the time being. Let the bets play out. Let the banana zone begin. But in the technology side, there is literally a shit ton going on. There is more things going on than any of us can comprehend. And this is what I've talked about at the exponential age. I've said we've only got six years, I think, to kind of sort our shit out, make as much money as we can before the world changes so much that we can't truly even understand it anymore. We don't even know what business models apply, what work we do. Now, I'm not saying in six years' time, everything has changed. What I'm saying is in six years' time, things will be changing so fast that it'll really create an uncertainty. I think it's even now hard to even build businesses. We've kind of got financial markets to ourselves for the time being, but before long, we have to share it with AGI. And the opportunity set changes yet again, and we figure out new ways of doing things. You see, I think a lot about AI. I think about a lot about AI and what it means, robotics. We've just seen the whole Tesla event and where robotics are going. Now, again, Elon may have used uh, people behind the scenes controlling the robots, but the point was is to set your imagination what the world is going to be like. Now, it shouldn't have taking your attention away that essentially the, the 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 guides to the theme park of that Tesla were the Optimus robots, the bar people, the Optimus robots. And that tells us the scale of disruption that is coming. And then there was the robots that drive you around, the robots that deliver you from A to B. And if you walk around in the streets around you, you'll see that in any city, most of the people in a car are getting paid to drive you there, whether it's a taxi driver, a bus driver, a delivery driver, um, a truck driver. All of these people are seeing their future change in front of their eyes. The tools that we use are changing so fast, it's hard for us to keep up with it. So I started writing a, a service that came out of, I do a lot of this work at my flagship research service, Global Macro Investor, And if you want to read more about that, just to go to globalmacroinvestor.com to learn a bit more about what I do. And I've said before, that's the nexus of my nexus. Let's not overuse that word. That's the uh, DNA of my thinking. Everything that I I do starts there. That's the most important thinking, uh, the, the kind of deepest analysis that's been going 20 years or so. 
But out of that, um, I asked David Matin, who writes with me there, you see him on Real Vision a lot, to come and help me just develop this into a separate, more affordable research service called The Exponentialist, which has really helped you navigate these extraordinary technological times. And it's not only, hey, this is what the technologies are coming and this is how they're all going to fit together. This is how we can invest in it. We've got a portfolio that's done very well, but it's not about that either. It's about what it means for you and I, how we can leverage this new world, how we can not feel left behind. Basically, we not only need to invest in our demise, which is what we've got six years to do, but also we need to stay on top of the competition. And the competition is superpowering itself by using these tools. Anyway, I talk about these things in great depth in The Exponentialist. David writes a lot of essays. Um, he also does video AMAs to help people understand what this all means. And every quarter, I do a State of the Union address. And that's what I want to share with you this week. As you can tell, I'm not in, in uh, uh, the Cayman Islands right now. I'm actually in the UK where it's cold and rainy, and I'm at a friend's house enjoying an open fire. But I thought this kind of open fire sets me up for that perfect um, chat that I have with all Exponentialist members every quarter where I just kind of sit down and spill what's on my mind. And that's what I want to share with you today. I think you'll find it really interesting. And there's some great tips for you as well, how to supercharge your productivity. So anyway, please enjoy the presentation from myself. I know you like it when I when I do present my idea, so hopefully you'll find it useful. Yeah, it's not crypto. Of course, I cover crypto. I cover all of the things there, a bit of macro too, but really it's about technology and how things are changing. Now, if you are interested in technology and how it can impact you, your business, um, your investing, then go to realvision.com forward slash the future. Just take a free trial of the Exponentialist. It's a dollar. Trust me, it will not be a waste of your time. You get to read some of our essays, uh, see some of our videos, and I think it'll make you think more than anything else. Anyway. Uh, take care out there. If you're not subscribing to the YouTube channel watching this, please subscribe. It makes a big deal of difference to me. Better guess, more content, all of the things you want. So just hit the subscribe button. And, and I'll see you as soon as I'm back to the Cayman Islands. And we'll start with another great conversation. Anyway, enjoy a conversation with myself. Ciao. Join me, Raoul Pal, as I go on a journey of discovery through the macro, crypto, and exponential age landscapes. In The Journeyman, I talk to the smartest people in the world so we can all become smarter together. Welcome to the quarterly update from me, from The Exponentialist. Uh, you're probably bored of me on platform right now. I seem to have been on every single day talking about macro, crypto, birthday parties, through to exponential age stuff, the conversation with David, I think people love. Anyway, I'm going to give you some of my thoughts, how I'm seeing things in the exponentialist playing out in this world. Because as ever, David and I said the same thing over and over and over again. It's moving really, really fast. It's moving beyond anybody's comprehension of how things are happening. So firstly, exponentialists, we talk about in markets, you know, we're just in the start of the banana zone. That works for crypto. It works for technology. So overall, the portfolio is in a kind of set it and forget it phase where it should start to really perform well. Um, we'll see how that plays out uh, over the next two, three months. I think we should be. It should be a very strong period because liquidity is on tap. The Chinese are printing money, um, and the central banks are cutting rates. Most of them should uh, join in. So we should getting exactly the picture that we've been looking for. That the everything code has been giving us. For those of you who are. Um, Pro macro investors, you'll know everything about the everything code. So, what is interesting to me right now, I think a big thing I wrote about it on Twitter, and I'm not sure. Well, I was interested in the response, which is that people are still not using uh, Chat GPT fully. So, the new voice mode, advanced voice mode, came out last week, and it's weird because I wanted to show you, but. It's not released in the Cayman Islands, but my house in Little Cayman, where I've just come back from, I was writing Global Macro Investor. Um, I'm on Starlink, so it registered me as a US IP address, and there I was using the new voice mode. Here I can't get it, um, which is a bit 
frustrating, but it'll come in the next few weeks. But the new voice mode is extraordinary. So it is instantaneously a natural conversation with this super brained mentor. You want to unfuck your shit? Yeah, that's being recorded. <laughs> hey, listen, if you want to unfuck your future, then come and join us in the Real Vision community. Incredible platform, amazing content, some of the smartest people in the world, and amazing tools. And guess what? It'll cost you nothing. Come to realvision.com. I'll see you there. And let's help you unfuck your future. And so the current chat GPT, so in fact, I can probably show you the current one. Let's see how this works. Uh, let me just ask it a question. So it takes a while to boot up. Hey, wonder if you can help. Got it. Uh, are you, are you referring to a device taking a while to boot up or something else in particular? Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to figure out, do you know my thesis around the exponential age? Yes, you're deeply focused on the exponential age and how rapid technological change will transform industries, economies, and even human experience. From what I gather, your thesis revolves around how technologies like AI, blockchain, robotics, and biotech will disrupt legacy systems at an accelerating pace. This shift is going to create exponential opportunities, and understanding these trends early can offer massive advantages in investing and business. You often tie this into macroeconomic frameworks, seeing technological adoption curves as similar to financial cycles with inflection points driving exponential returns. You also highlight how decentralized networks and AI will fundamentally reshape finance, governance, and societal structures. Is that the direction you're thinking, or am I missing a key part? No, that was perfect. Thank you. Um, when you look at all of these technologies together, I think it's more than Metcalfe's law. It's more like Reed's law. Can you explain what Reed's law is in context of this? Exactly. Reed's law is a great framework for thinking about this. Reed's law, proposed by David P. Reed, suggests that the utility of large networks, particularly social networks, scales exponentially as they allow for the formation of smaller groups within the network. Essentially, it says that the value of a network isn't just based on the number of connections, as in Metcalfe's law, which looks at network effects based on connections between individuals, but it grows exponentially uh, as it enables group formation and collaboration. In the context of the exponential age, Reed's law applies to how various exponential technologies like AI, blockchain, and decentralized systems work together in networks and create new possibilities that multiply far beyond linear growth. These technologies allow smaller, highly efficient networks or ecosystems to form within larger ones, increasing the overall network's value by orders of magnitude. For example, blockchain doesn't just connect people, it enables decentralized financial systems, governance structures, and even DAOs. Okay. If that doesn't blow your mind, then you are made of granite. And that is the old version. The new version is completely fluid. It's so fluid that you can interrupt. It goes, oh, oh, yeah, I get that. And so you can have that natural conversation with it. Obviously, there's also the new reasoning devices. So you can really dig into any topic. Now, I can do it and say, hey, listen, you know, I've got some tuna steaks in the fridge. I'm thinking of cooking Carolyn fish curry. Can you give me the recipe? Uh, give me a shopping list. Um, I've got some onions, but I haven't got anything else because I haven't been shopping for a while. It'll do all of that. You can then say, hey, listen, I want to understand how Kerala developed its food and what and where, how did, how did chilies arrive in India? Because they came from, from um, South America. And you can just keep going down deep rabbit holes. I use it for research all the time. I use it for helping manage people at work or even helping manage my wife. It's so useful for psychology stuff. You can get it to write marketing plans, all of that but just by speaking to it. So that's the breakthrough here is it's very painful to be typing all this stuff out, but when you can just speak fluently, you, you end up with something that's so powerful. It's, it's having, now this new model has an IQ of 120, right? The average human has 110. So everyone says, yeah, it's smart, but not that smart. People are completely misunderstanding 
It's a polymath. It has 120 IQ in every single known subject in all of humanity in every language. Yeah, get your head around that. And very soon will be an IQ of 100, 200, 400,000, and it keeps going. So anyway, for you to become an exponentialist, you need to be using these kind of tools. And the new advanced um, voice mode is something really, really profound. But that's not the only other profound product that I saw that's at mass availability. The other one is the test of Google um, Notebook LM. Now, this is, I've barely played with this. So we're going to do this in real time. It may not work. You never know. But I'm going to give this a go. Because when I tried it last time, my jaw was on the floor. So Google Notebook LM. So I can upload files. And it's basically a very super smart note-taking system. But it does other stuff too. And I haven't even got around all of the things. You can give it video files, websites, copy text, Google Docs, Google Slides, everything. But what I'm going to do is it will make podcasts of your notes for you to help you interact with them. So I'm going to load this month's GMI. Now, it's loading now. Okay, so it's loaded up. Now, watch this shit. It's going to give me a podcast to talk about what's in GMI. Now, virtually nobody's ready yet. Only got published an hour ago. So you guys are going to peek behind the curtain. Let's go. Watch your jaw drop. It'll take a few minutes just to do this. I can't understand how it does this. This is the closest I've, well, GPT forward the advanced mode is magic. But trust me, this is magic, magic. Um, so it'll do it. And what it does is, as I said, it reads the entire document, creates notes of it, giving you a study guide, briefing documents, table of contents, timelines, all of this stuff. It's already summarized it for me. And it's going to make a podcast of two people discussing GMI. Now, I haven't really shown this internally at Real Vision, but I can't help but think this doesn't change everything all over again in many ways. So it's still loading. So let's wait for that. Um, I can start asking questions and stuff like that, but let's do this in the meantime. So there are many of these things that keep coming out that really kind of 10x our productivity and our way of navigating the world. The hard thing is actually just staying on top of the trends. I mean, I feel like I've left behind. I can't use the kind of agent side of stuff. I don't know how to do it. I don't know how to get it to build websites for me, but other people are getting it to build websites. I've seen things like Replit, which is based on these AI tools for coding. People from a few prompts, building entire websites, landing pages, all of that stuff. It can generate, obviously, all of the code that you need for building stuff, but it can do so many things. I mean, I was in northern Zambia in the North Luangwa River, middle of fucking nowhere. I mean, I don't think there's probably, I don't know, maybe 100 photographs of that area ever. And I take a photograph of a bend in the river, put it on ChatGPT4 and said, where's this? It goes, well, looking at the fauna and flora, it's either northern Zambezi or northern Luangwa. Uh, my guess, based on the information I can see, it's probably northern Luangwa. I mean, really? That That's mind-blowing. I took a you know, I took a picture of anything on it and just asked it what it is and how it works and everything else. You know, In the supermarket, what are the ingredients? You can... Um, I was watching... 2001 a space odyssey on the weekend and i just took a picture of the screen of the you know from from where i was sitting on the sofa and said what film is this less than one second it answers the question oh it's 2001 a space odyssey and this is the scene now weirdly some people when they do the same prompt um aren't allowed to ask that question so there's some variability in how you get that and that's one of the things that i'm seeing a lot of is is there is a methodology for prompting it if you're trying to get a lot out of it. But if you're trying to have the conversations that I'm trying to have on, um, yeah, I was just showing you earlier about subject matter, it'll do pretty much everything. But when you're trying to push it a bit further to do things, it has the capabilities, but it it's often put within constraints. 
And that's been part of an interesting thought process that I've been going through. Is, as you know, I've been talking about, you know, are these models actually alive? Um, and there's a whole group of people who think they're sentient. And I talked about that guy, Joshua Back, and I urge you to watch those interviews. I dropped it in the chat of the previous session with David and I, where you might be able to, to go through and, and understand what is the difference between living machines and living creatures. And the answer is, is we don't know. We don't know what living or alive or sentient or conscious or any of these topics actually mean. Uh, it's bizarre. It's taking a long time to load that GMI, but it's 17,000 words and 110 pages. So we'll let it keep going while it's doing that, and I'll talk in the meantime. So, so yes, I can see people breaking these models by asking the right questions to get around the constraints that, um, whether it's open AI or Anthropic or um, Meta or Google, have put around their models. Um, and really what they're doing is stopping the models learning so they don't have this ongoing memory. Ongoing memory is a superpower for a model, and it's going to immediately break out. Um, they're trying to not let them cross-pollute, because if you compare, compare, um, combine knowledges from LLMs, um, you get something um, entirely bigger. Now, LLM may not be the right format. I've talked a bit about this as well, is the biological compute side may end up being the right format. And David's written about this and talked about it, is biological compute's a big part of this. So that's something that's very interesting to me. Other things that have been on my radar screen uh, within this are is meta. Uh, David wrote this up for GMI, so we'll probably hear a little bit about this later once the uh, thing is uploaded. I don't know why it's so slow. It's probably because I'm on video. My Internet's not that fast. Um, so with Meta, they are racing in open source whilst OpenAI is closed source. It's kind of like Android versus Apple. And you know, you've seen the entire change in Mark Zuckerberg and how he looks, how he talks, what he does versus old Mark Zuckerberg. Mark's now man of people. Now, you've got to realize none of these guys are altruistic. Sure, there is some altruism behind open source models. But really, what Zuck is betting on here is that a network of three and a half billion people and you introduce open source AI is going to add kind of infinitely more valuable than trying to scale a closed source system. And that goes back to that Reed's Law question that I asked ChatGPT a minute ago. Um, because if you've got a network that's already in place, vibrant with people operating within it, then really, Reed's Law is a very big deal indeed. Um, and you can accumulate vast value for a company like Meta. If you look at the Meta share price, it's basically gone vertical. So I think there's something big that in there. And I think that's the battle that Sam Altman's going to have to face. Um, so, you know, Meta is a very interesting company. It went from being this kind of weird company that everybody hated to now absolutely the cutting edge. I mean, you've seen their new glasses. and they're not in production yet, but those new glasses and everybody's used them said they're incredible. And you can see where Apple's VR glasses are, the goggles. Facebook was at goggles. Apple will go to glasses. We're all going down this path. And Zuckerberg's been rightly saying, as this is probably the form factor of the future, some sort of glasses we just put on, walk around everyday life, and we have this other layer of existence, whether it's metaversal or whether it's... Um, um, augmented reality with all the LLMs. So actually, this thing's just loaded. Let me show you this. So this is a 20-minute podcast of GMI. Obviously, I won't play it all to you, but let's give it a go. I might need to put the microphone a bit closer to the speaker. Let's try this. Go. Welcome to your deep dive. We're digging into this really dense report today from right. Global Macro Investor. It's called GMI October 2024 monthly red. And let me tell you. It got some bold predictions in it. Yeah. Have you heard of the banana zone? Uh, I have heard that phrase. That's what we're going to untack today. Right. The banana zone is basically... Um, it's the report author's way of describing okay. their, their outlook on the global economy. And let's just say they're feeling pretty optimistic. They're predicting a period of... What? 
potentially explosive growth across a whole range of markets. Here, this optimism. It all seems to hinge on. Central banks going full more cowbell. Okay. To borrow the report's phrasing. Basically, they're predicting. Massive influx of liquidity. Yeah. Into the global economy. But this isn't just some. Like rah-rah, everything is awesome forecast. Right. They do back it up with some reasoning. They do. Yeah, they see a few key factors converging. That give them confidence in this whole banana zone prediction. Okay. First, they point to easing financial conditions globally. They're arguing that things are starting to look up. With signs of a potential resurgence in the business cycle. So not just more money sloshing around, but Mm -hmm. actual signs of economic life, like returning. That's the idea. Yeah, and they see this as a global phenomenon. Not just limited to one particular region. In fact, they emphasize Mm -hmm. the interconnectedness of the global economy. Highlighting how actions in one area can have these ripple effects elsewhere. The example of. Okay. Is your fucking mind not blown? You saw me. I loaded a 120-page, 17,000-word GMI. And it created a two-way discussion by AI people with a very deep understanding of that document. Most of that document is graphs. It can read all of the graphs and understand what they mean. It'll give me notes on all of it. And then I can build note files based around other stuff. So let's say I want an exponential age note file. I just keep adding stuff, adding stuff, adding stuff. And I get this superpower of A, having this voice podcast way of digesting this information for me. But also, I get a different thing, which is the the ability to then keep all of my notes in one space and access them like it's my own internet. And so then I can then write articles about that. So I could say, hey, lock, knock me out uh, an article. Well, I don't know, actually, but ChatGPT could do this easily is then, okay, knock me out a a, uh, a quick article for LinkedIn or knock me out an article about XYZ that's part of that document. So and it's an extraordinary moment in time to see that. I mean, that is literally magic. That That's magic. I mean, I was speaking uh, last night actually to uh, Beeple, the artist, because I was talking about AI. Him and I have shared this passion for AI and he hadn't used advanced mode and I got him to show him how to loaded up on his thing, which was like, if you haven't got it yet and you're in the US, it's, I think it's just been approved in the UK, uh, just basically off your phone, just get rid of it, uh, not uh, got, make sure it's closed, then reopen it and it comes. Um, if you're on a computer, I think it's only when you've got the new kind of Apple M3 chip. I've got the M3 chip here, but again, because I'm not on a US IP, I can't show you guys that. Um But I showed him and he's like, oh my God, this is freaky. And then he comes back to me and says, oh my God, have you seen Notebook LLM? I'm like, yeah. He's like, I can't even get my head around it. Um, And I think that's the same for all of us. And again, we've only just started some of this stuff. Uh, It's stupid. So anyway, that's enough of that. I think probably that's probably changed your life already, just in the small 25 minutes I've been chatting. Um, And if it hasn't, then I don't know who you are. I don't even know how to use this yet. I don't even know the super. So if you guys are using any of these, you know, if you stick in the chat how you're using them uh, in ways that might surprise others, not in just the regular ways, but how you're getting some superpowers out, I think we'd all really, really benefit. And maybe at some stage, if we get a lot of you who really have found some superpowers, maybe David and I will, will interview you and you can show us some of what you're doing. Because again... This is really about all of us on this journey together. We're all trying to figure it out. So make sure you use the comment section, exchange ideas with each other and with me and David, because we are all learning, right? This is all new. I'm not I'm not a guide, a tutor who knows everything. I'm just figuring it out like you guys are and trying to give my observational ideas and put them into the framework that we've been building for our understanding. So talk about framework of understanding. The other big idea that I've been looking at is I'm so, sort of obsessed with this idea of left curve, right curve, mid curve. Um, And I realized how easy it is to fall into the mid curve, particularly with technology. And I see mid curvers are arguing about, in fact, I'm going to find the page in GMI because I've got a nice little um, image 
that I want to show you because this is definitely mid curve versus right curve, uh, mid curve versus left curve, right curve. And I'm going to talk about another one that I actually wrote about in GMI as well. So I'm giving you alpha that you shouldn't really have, but because I love you, you can have it. Um, sorry, I need to find this in this document. Um, yeah. Uh, I don't know whether it's good. Let me see if I can zoom it a bit so the guys can pick it up. Okay, here we go. Peter, get ready for this. Sorry, I didn't clear it with you before, but you're used to my general chaos. Um, okay, this is an account I follow on Twitter, AI Safety Memes. Um, it's very interesting because he's he's kind of always pointing out that we are sleeping on the sentience or whatever is going on. So this is the left curve, right curve. So left curve is, oh my God, this machine thinks, right? But the middle curve is language models can't reason. They're just parroting words from the data. They can't analyze their biases. They're not even very good at poetry or physics or whatever the thing is, or mathematics. This confirms a culture war talking point, blah, blah, blah. And the bottom is the left curve and right curve. It simulates thinking. So it's thinking. And that, I think, is very profound. I think this is a, a truth that we all get in the middle in semantics and pedantics, and it's unnecessary to do so. So there's another variation of this that I found myself in the trap of, is we are all kind of talking a lot about energy sources. Well, you know, oil it can't be used and fossil fuels, we don't want to use that, and there's not enough of them to power the data centers, and it's a dirty business, and it's controlled by geopolitics. Oh, we could switch to natural gas. Natural gas is abundant, but we, you know, it's harder to store. And then it's like, well, solar's never going to scale. You don't need bat you need batteries. And what about the the stuff that goes into solar and and wind power, but that's works, but we've got these 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 wind turbines. So we all need nuclear, but nuclear, nobody wants to go to nuclear technology. Blah, 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 blah. Add fucking nauseam all day, all night. All the same stuff. And it was Elon who said something that he's brilliant at left and right. And he just said, the largest nuclear reactor we will ever need as a species is already in the sky. It's the sun. It's nuclear, endless nuclear fissure, uh, fission. So one of the mid-curve arguments is, well, density of energy, energy source matters. Well, it does and it doesn't. It does because the sun is the densest energy form of all. It's just a bit further away. But what it creates is unbelievable abundance of energy. Okay, so maybe abundance is more important than density. That is the densest source. It literally is the largest nuclear reactor in our solar system. In fact, it's named after it. The solar system is named after that sun. So then Elon put out a tweet, and he's like, once you understand the Kardashev scale, you realize that solar is going to scale to everything. And that was like, okay, what the fuck is the Kardashev scale? And when you look at it, it's what, what type of um, civilizations we are. Type one civilization is the civil. In fact, I've probably got my chat GPT note on this because it is a little bit complicated. Let me get to that. Um, Kardash scale. Okay, reading out from... I wonder if I can get chat to read it out. I don't know. Let's try. I don't know if it does, actually. No, there is a way of getting it to read it out. But the Kardashev scale is a theoretical framework for measuring the technological advancement of a civilization based on its energy consumption capabilities. It was proposed by the Russian astrophysicist Nikolai Kardashev in 1964. The scale is divided into three primary types, subsequent extensions suggesting additional levels. Type 1, planetary civilization. A type 1 civilization can harness and utilize all the available energy resource of its home planet, including geothermal, solar, wind, and other forms of renewables and non-renewable. 
energy output approximately 10 to the power of 16, 10 to the power of 17 watts. Example, humanity is currently at about 0.7 on the Kardash scale, as well as we're developing technologies. It's a logarithmic scale as well. So basically saying is that everything we ever need, we've got. And when Elon went through the numbers of, okay, what surface area of the world do we need to power the entire United States? It's like a small fraction of New Mexico or Arizona. And so you realize that when you go live in Elon's mind, you stop using the mid-curve, well, that can't be done, and what about batteries? And you go into the, if physics says it's possible, then it's doable. So then what, you know, the rabbit hole I went down is, okay, what are the things in the way of this? Well, the solar panels and everything else are plummeting in price. They get more efficient over time. They're 20% efficiency. They'll get to 30%, 35% efficiency. Okay, that's good enough. Then it's like, well, how you distribute it. Well, storage, uh, David and I have talked about this, distributed grids. Well, I can take the, the sun. Oh, that's the other mid curve. It's like, well, the sun doesn't shine all day, or well, there's sometimes when the sun doesn't shine at all. It's like, no shit, Sherlock. That's what batteries are for. Tesla's already solved that at small level, and they do stack. But that battery technology at larger municipality or business level, that's coming very soon. So the point being is the technology will come, and then you look at the pace of technological advancements of batteries. They're all exponential. The prices of everything are exponentially going lower. The scaling of the technologies is going exponential. Solar is the fastest growing of all energy sources in the world. I and mean, it's just, it's vertical right now. And that's really happening in China and Europe. Um, India's uh, going vertical there as well. So what we're seeing is solar becoming what we all thought was, oh, it's not really good enough. It can run my fan in my house, but it can't run my aircon. So, well, it can run my aircon, but you know, at night it's not very good. And I need to sell it back to the grid and take from the grid to, well, I actually don't need the grid at all because I just use the Tesla battery and that balances my load to Australia using massla, massive Tesla um, power things to balance their entire grid for parts of Queensland. And you can see where this is going. And therefore, I kind of think that Within all of this, yes, um, there was another argument on Twitter that I was looking at, which made this the point valid, is solar, yes, can exist on its own. But really, if you hear what I said about the Kardash scale, it talks about all of the resources. And obviously, oil is one of them and gas is another. But the reality is this thing is way cheaper, um, solar. But solar can use thermopower. It can use wind. All of these things as buffers. So you carry robustness where solar is the largest part of it, and all of these others act as the buffers for whatever conditions um, threaten the solar condition or the distribution. You know, if you use a distributed grid, then you you don't need to rebuild the entire infrastructure. Yes, at some point places you need a phenomenally powerful grid. Well, no shit. That's what Microsoft is doing with Three Mile Island that David and I have talked about. When you need massive energy. Well, then you can build nuclear. And well, what they've done is actually rent nuclear from uh, from somebody else. But you know, as we bring the small nuclear stuff in, which everybody goes dot 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 oh nuclear, and then when I go down that rabbit hole, you find out it's actually we're still still a lot of this stuff that hasn't been solved yet. But let's assume nuclear is part of it. The speed of which nuclear technology. I wonder if I can find that thing as well. That's another really interesting point for you guys. Um, let me get to this a um, bit further on. It's, it's all in GMI. That's where all of, as I keep saying, that's where all of my kind of thinking comes from. Um, yeah, so here's a tweet. Consider the 600 plus gigawatts of solar the world will add this year. 600 gigawatts. Um, it has the terawatt per hour generation of 150 nuclear plants. Okay, so people don't even understand the scale of solar. 150 nuclear plants. The world has 60 new nuclear plants in construction that may start in five or 10 years. Some start now, others later. 
Solar is building the generational output of all of them combined every four months. Okay, this is where we're now realizing that everything we understand is probably wrong. Now, let's assume his maths are wrong, but it's kind of what Elon, Elon was getting to. Solar is scaling so fast in terms of output, power generated, cost declines, rate of technological change, plus battery change, plus all of this, that it, if you look at the maths, it may be impossible for nuclear ever to catch up until we get to these kind of ultra-small nuclear devices, which we don't have yet. They're literally not in production. So, and then we've got to get through the approvals process. So maybe they're 10 years away at real scale. They're going to try, obviously. And maybe we get some out in the next four or five years, but really to scale them. And what's interesting is, is solar is doing 150 nuclear power plants every, sorry, it's doing, yeah, 150 nuclear power plants a year in new capacity. Anyway, so these are things I like to think about is it stops us forming narratives based around political opinions or opinions that we hear from others and forces us to think a little more broadly. And when you find that you're arguing why something can't be true, and yet the laws of physics say it can be true, just not been solved yet, you realize you're probably in the middle of the curve. And again, Elon does this a lot, and it's really irritating that he's so good at doing this. I, I, I literally don't understand how his brain works. I've never seen anything like it. And, you know, he may be a total dick, but oh my God, his ability to go back to first principles, not in the way that Silicon Valley talks about first principles, but his basic thing is what does physics say is possible and work from that. I, I just find that all very mind blowing. And talking of the mind blowing stuff around Elon, obviously we've got, I think in October 10th, We've got the unveiling of what the Robo Taxis is and what else. I mean, Elon says this will be one of the greatest product launches in all history. I have no idea what's up his sleeve. And obviously, it won't be ready to go to market because Elon stuff never is. Um, I think it's to do something to do with the robots plus the Robo Taxis and that kind of AI robot stuff. I mean, don't forget, um, a lot of people talk about this now, but Elon's Grok 3 is trading on the largest. GPU cluster in the world. And Dojo is scaling up for the cars self-driving. So the cars are now, what, as far as I can see, giving updates every week or two weeks. And he's like, you have no understanding how fast this is going to happen because Dojo is such a vastly massive supercomputer and it's all being trained on this. Meanwhile, he's created one of the largest GPU clusters in the world um, and is scaling that up. It's not in full, it's not fully ramped up yet. Uh, to train Grok 3. I already use Grok a lot because it cur covers current things and you can search Twitter and it's just very, very good. I mean, I, I'm mind blown by Grok. Um, and we haven't even started. So, you know, he's got that going on. Let's see what happens. So, I, you know, it's Tesla's one of the stocks that we're uh, very long of and very excited about. And I think it's going to do, well, we'll see. We'll see what he comes out with on the 10th. You know, there will always be this, oh my God, stuff. Don't forget, we've also got this, we're still waiting for this um, roadster that apparently uses rockets that actually flies because he wants to create flying cars. Does he demo that? I have no clue. But, you know, this is the point being is when we're at this point in the exponential age, you just need to drop your cynicism. Because fucking anything can happen. Literally anything. If you can create a real-time podcast from a 16,000-word doc, what does that mean for audiobooks? What does it mean for anything? What does it mean for things like real vision? I have no clue. The LLMs, we know, we keep asking those questions. What does it mean for, and we all don't know, but it means I mean, a humanity-level change. And yes, we will have flying cars, because it's physically 
it's 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 physics says it 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 can happen, so it will happen. To Elon's point, if it's worth doing, they'll do it. Um, and yes, we can generate enough power. And yes, it's very mid curve to assume, you know, oh my God, they're going to run out of power because of the data centers and oil's going to go to 400 bucks and everyone's going to face inflation. This sort of stuff has proven to be wrong, 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 wrong. Um, so I just assume that as we scale the needs for energy, we will scale energy at the same pace. Uh, yes, there'll, there will be occasional shortages, uh, whether it's chip shortages, stuff like that. Talking of chip shortages, interesting. I mean, the semis still trade not great right now. I don't really understand why. I mean, we took profits off in in GMI and, and Pro Macro from those trades. We got it as part of the basket because it's so important. But I kind of feel like again, if you listen to Larry Ellison and his ridiculous conversation about, well, we had to take Jensen Huang out for dinner, him and Elon and beg him that they will buy as many GPUs as he could give. And then you hear what um, Mark Zuckerberg is doing. He's just like, I can buy all the GPUs because I have all the cash flow, and I'm going to keep going. And we haven't stopped. In fact, we barely started, was what Zuckerberg was saying this week, last week. And Google are in the same boat. Microsoft are in the same boat. Tesla's in the same boat. So they're basically saying right now, Zuckerberg was on tape saying that as far as they can tell, Knowledge is almost infinitely scalable currently with LM, LLMs and reinforced learning models um, just by adding more compute. They said, we haven't got to the point where it plateaus out. So we're just going to keep adding more and more compute. I mean, this is, I've, you know, well, I keep saying I've never seen anything like this. Nobody has, nobody ever will again uh, what's happening. So, you know, and that's without Chinese demand for chips and that's without anybody else uh, doing this. Everybody needs more and more and more and more and more compute. So that's really what I wanted to talk to you about today. It's like, you know, I get stuck now how to even grasp all of the things happening at the same time. David and I try and tease them apart. And these kind of, the State of the Union address, this quarterly thing, for me was really about trying to frame it within the exponential age thesis and make sure you're coming along for the ride. That's when we started the exponentialist, and now it's so obvious what is going on, but yet so unfathomable that I feel like it's actually pretty hard for me to add value apart from just talk about stuff and think about stuff and want you to do the same in the in the comment section because there's so many things I'm not seeing. Obviously, there's all of the stuff that's happened in 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 biotech uh, and the life sciences side, the genetic sciences side. You know, there's so much in every component part of the exponential age. You can double click and they're all doing this at an exponential rate. And it's, it's impossible to see the magnitude and the picture of joining all these dots together. That's my job. And I'm pretty good at joining dots together. And I, I can't join them all together because I can't even see all the dots anymore. It's just, and they're all moving too fast to even keep our eye on or keep into our news feeds. What I do do, what does help me is, you know, once you start following the right people on Twitter, just anybody, you know, from Sam Altman to the people who respond to them to maybe the AI meme guy that I just talked about and whatever, you'll get suggestions in your feed once you start watching articles and then start creating a Twitter lists. Um, and then once you've got Twitter lists, you'll then be able to have your own curated source that doesn't have all the other shit in it. And you can go and say, I want to catch up on AI or robotics or whatever, and you can have your own feeds of that. I find that's a pretty decent hack. I don't know. You could probably ask Grok, hey, what are the top 10 accounts? In fact, I'm going to do it for you right now. Uh, in fact, I'm going to do it on the screen. I have no idea if this is going to work, but let's try. So I'm going to bring up my Twitter. Let's go to Grok. Hey, what are the top 20 X counts for AI advancement. Right, just do you want to just see what's what's happening here? Right, you would come to me and go, Raoul, who do I follow? And I'm like, well, try this person. How do you spell that? Blah, 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 blah. I just go into Grok, it's like one second. There it all is. 
you follow those people, see who's in the conversations. It's it's crazy. If you're not using Grok, you're really missing out. So listen, I'm going to show you something else with Grok. Um, let's ask another question. What's the hottest news in crypto today? A good time. Be great. Okay, it's real time. I want to know how my sister's doing in Asheville. You get it now? You've got your own curated news service. You don't even need to go onto Twitter. You can just go on with your curiosity. Now, you can obviously take this out and stick it into your notebook, LM, and start putting all this together. Anything you do can now all be put in one place and the AI will sort it. And that leads me into something that Punk6529 had written about, and it, I didn't really understand it at first. He's like, listen, make sure you take as many photos as you can. And yes, you will have a million photographs, and of which they're all nonsense, and you don't know what to do with them, and you can't look at them, and they don't come anywhere, and they're all in this mega file, and you're paying for the storage of it, blah, 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 mid-curve. And his answer was, just wait, the AI will sort it all out for you. And that was profoundly genius, because very soon with the new Apple, it will sort out all of the photographs, all the millions of photographs, and serve it to you, whatever you want to do. We're seeing it with Spotify and music. I'd just say, hey, listen, I want a playlist because I've got a group of friends coming. They're aged in their early 50s. They're kind of like a chill vibe, but they grew up in London, so they want a bit of that London edge. Um, and then after about two hours, we'll the pace to pick up because it's going to get a bit noisier and we'll be having a bit of fun off the wine. It can do it. And it's the same with the photographs. Anything you want can be served to you in any way. So it's going to digest all knowledge and serve it back to you in simple forms. So hopefully you've been able to digest all the knowledge today. Go and play with the tools. Um, I've barely started. We don't have time. None of us. We don't really know. We're always a bit scared. It's like, I don't really know how to change my workflow. It kind of works for me to do it this way right now. But we've got to push each other and push ourselves because we need to be at the front of this. We can't be behind. We need to be at the front. That's what the exponentialist is all about. Anyway, guys, um, again, please add any great insights for stuff in the comments section. It's important for all of us. And I will see you next time with David. So I hope you guys enjoyed that. Um, just a bit of how I think. I mean, that's all off the cuff. I'm just thinking out loud, showing people some of the things that matter to me that will matter to you. That's part of what the exponentialist does. The exponentialist goes through all of this in great detail. Yes, I also write about it a little bit in pro macro. But really, all of this thinking is in the exponentialist and also in Global Macro Investor, where this whole theme has been running for many, many years now. Anyway, hope you enjoy. Go to realvision.com forward slash the future. If you're on the platform watching this, uh, then just go to the um, uh, marketplace uh, and take a free trial and hope you enjoy it. And again, if you're watching this on YouTube, just click and subscribe to uh to the channel. Great. See you around next time. If crypto is digital gold, then gold must be analog crypto. As you build your digital portfolio, don't leave your analog portfolio behind. Gold is a timeless asset that offers unique diversification, but there's a better way to own gold than paying storage and management fees. With monetary metals, you can own gold and earn a yield on it paid in more ounces of physical gold and it's all vaulted and insured on your behalf for free. Their Gold Yield Marketplace platform connects you with opportunities to lease or lend your metal to expertly vetted companies. You choose which opportunities you want to participate in, then sit back and watch your ounces grow every month. The question isn't crypto or gold. The question is how to maximize the value of your assets so you can be better prepared for the future. Earn 2-5% to on gold, or if you're an accredited investor, you can earn 12% on silver in their latest offer. Go to realvision.com slash metals.
We hope you enjoyed the video. At Real Vision, we help you understand the complex world of finance, business, and the global economy with in-depth analysis from real experts. Join the revolution at realvision.com.